Hi everyone, I'm Ben Kaplan, CEO of PR Hacker, and welcome to Marketing is Contagious, How to Build Buzz in Record Time. And to everyone watching the live stream from all around the world, I am really excited to be with you here today. What we are talking about today, what we are all about, is how do you accelerate your marketing ROI? How do you achieve disproportionate leverage? And what I mean by that is $1 you invest isn't equal $1 of, of marketing worth you get out, it's equal to $10 or $100. One hour of marketing time you invest isn't worth an hour of result, it's worth 10 hours or 100 hours. How do you get that from your marketing programs? And how can you get that by understanding the viral principles that make ideas wanna spread? How can you incorporate that into your existing marketing plans to make them much more effective? PR Hacker, we always like to be twice as efficient and effective as we were before. Or also, how can you incorporate that into new marketing plans you had never even thought about, new tactics or strategies you had never even considered? How can you do that as well? And that's what we're gonna discuss today. So I always say, before you take advice from anyone, um, I, I, I live by this mantra, which is be careful of who you take advice from, but be patient with those who give it. And so let me give you a little bit about our perspective, how we look at the world, and hopefully you'll be a little patient with the advice I share with you today. So. Um, at PR Hacker, we're a different kind of agency. Um, we're data-driven, we're viral optimized, and we're growth focused. So in today's session, you're gonna learn and see a lot of these principles in action. Data-driven, we will A-B test or multivariate test eight different viral pitch headlines that we're seeding with media outlets or influencers. We'll show you how we do that. Uh, viral optimized, we're all about how do ideas spread? How can we activate certain triggers? We're gonna talk about how emotions are contagious later in this session. How can we use that to our advantages to get messages to spread faster, more quickly, and more effectively? And third, growth focus. So we want all of these viral marketing principles, we want our contagious marketing principles to drive a bottom line metric, ROI, a KPI for our company. We just don't want a, a, a cute viral cat video that we're attached to but doesn't really do anything for our business. How does it drive an end business goal? And you're gonna see all three of those principles in action. Um, and, and, and just to understand where we've been from, where we've come from, um, uh, we got our start actually with a book I wrote back in 1999 called How to Go to College Almost for, for Free. And it was a book that went viral. It went from being self-published in my parents' garage to having two million readers worldwide. And a lot of that was how we established a lot of these core principles that now motivate our global agency today. And, and, and we have clients that you see over our timeline ranging from CPG companies like, uh, for brands like Smuckers and Milkbone and Meow Mix and Del Monte to some really huge companies in the world, iconic companies like Budweiser or City or Mercedes, all companies we've worked with. So this is a little sense of our timeline, but what I wanna share with you today are the key insights um, the key uh, sort of strategies that we implemented that not only accelerated us as a, as a company, but for our clients made the difference in achieving this contagious marketing result. Um, here's a little bit of some of the scrappy startups and the big name brands we worked with. Um, and that brings us to the central question, which is how can we get more results in less time? And let's start with context, because I believe that context is contagious and you might be wondering what I mean by context and so let's illustrate it with an example which is why is this viral I don't know if you recognize this photo but this is in case you, you can't see too clearly a couple making out there's someone making out right now in San Francisco in New York in Berlin and in Sydney but it's not news so why was this one of the three most published photos in the world in uh, 2011 and it deals with context. So to see that context, let's zoom out. And you can see here, if we look at the big picture, um, that the, it's a couple kissing in the middle of the 2011 Vancouver riots, which is, was a, a riot because the hockey team in Vancouver didn't win. And so what is significant is not that it's just the action here, the couple kissing, but it's all of the context around what's going on that makes this important and makes this newsworthy. So put another way, this, is your product and I don't care if that is a consumer app b2b you know enterprise ad tech solution uh, if it's uh, something for a super small niche market or a really broad market where everyone in the world can be your customer this is your product because 
in the scheme of what's being spread, in the scheme of what's buzzworthy, what's newsworthy, what's noteworthy, there's a lot of things to compete with in the world, right? There's war breaking out, there's hurricanes happening, there's a million other uh, things going on that are, that are very important. So in that context, we're not the most important thing going on most likely. But just because that's our product doesn't mean that we can't build strategic context around our product or our company or our cause to make us suddenly really important, make us suddenly really buzzworthy, make us suddenly an idea or a brand that's worth spreading. So that's the theoretical underpinning, but let's see this in action and how we can use context to make our marketing more contagious. Okay? So just to sum up, strategic context makes your product more contagious. And here's an example from a client of ours, Kloof, which is, um, think of it this way, it's like Instagram for pet lovers where you can share photos of your pets doing cute things. And they came to us at the time where they had zero users, zero traction, a Chilean company that was trying to launch in the United States. And um, they said, hey, could you do a press re release for us to help launch us? And we said, well, we could do that. Yes, we, we do a lot of press releases for our clients. But instead, let's embrace this idea of context to make you potentially more viral and make the idea about your company spread faster. Okay, so here's what we did. We said, what if the strategic context for Kloof was actually romance? So one thing that we noticed that you could do with the app is you could see other um, people walking their dog ar ar around you. And so we thought, okay, well, one application is you could potentially go on a doggy walking date. So can we use the strategic context of romance to make Kloof much more viral, much more contagious, much more interesting, much more news newsworthy, much more buzzworthy. And here's how we did it. We did a survey of 2,000 people to determine what your dog breed reveals about you, but put it a little more simply, like which is the best dog breed to get a hot date. And just as an aside, um, the results from the survey were if you're a woman, you'd like to attract a guy, the best dog breed you can have is a golden retriever. You're seen as sweet and loving and caring. If you're a guy and you'd like to attract a woman, the best dog breed you can have is a Siberian Husky. You're seen as strong, powerful, and responsible. Okay, so that was the result of our, of our survey. We had some funny results with that as well. Um, and we created a, that context of romance around this app, and here was the result. So 200 plus media outlets covered our story. This is the Today Show, which in the US is uh, a top ra rated morning show. For four minutes with an average viewership of seven million people, they discussed the Kloof survey results. They uh, put you know, uh, the, the, the company on, on the screen um, and it was the equivalent of a multi-million dollar ad buy because we created the strategic context. Or the other two morning shows in the US, um, Good Morning America, CBS This Morning, also, six to seven million viewers. They're running headlines like what dogs, what they say about you, what your dog says about your sex life. That was one of the viral headlines we actually pitched them that we had A-B tested at PR Hacker. So suddenly we've gotten the top three TV morning shows in the US simply by creating an interesting and a strategic context. But it's not, it doesn't stop there. Time also runs the headline, what your dog says about your, your sex life. Huffington Post Green, the top newspapers in the UK, in the UK for instance, you own a chihuahua, then you're dumb but hot. <laughs> what your dog says about you to the opposite sex. Or the number two newspaper in the UK, in, in Canada, the Globe and Mail, can your dog get you dates? So really powerful context of how, of how str strategic, uh, concept of how strategic context can really work. This story spreads to 21 countries um, all around the world. You can see they're running a picture of Paris Hilton here with her chihuahua um, in a lot of foreign countries. It becomes a viral story all over. Kloof goes from, um, from zero to 20,000 new users downloaded the app within 24 hours. So can you make your product, your company, your cause more relevant? Can you make it something that people need to talk about today? That's the power of context and that's why context is contagious. Brings us to part two, ideas are contagious. So we know that we can make our product more relevant, more interesting, more worth talking about. But are there certain ideas and concepts about our product or our company or our brand or our cause that naturally are more spreadable? What can we do to make the entire messaging about our product more shareable and more spreadable? So let's talk about what makes an idea easy to spread, and, and there's lots of things that, 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 that people discuss, um, but three of the most important that we found, and we've done a lot of testing on this, number one, 
is that it's got to be simple. There's just too many distractions now with people are text messaging and they're getting, you know, uh, uh, phone calls and they're at the same time getting all, flashed all kinds of digital advertising and messages and they've got a million other things going on in their lives. So simple, you need it to be simple, simply to, to just break through the clutter. And the goal that I like to say with PR Hacker clients is that when we try to simplify your message. We're not just trying to simplify it so that someone can understand it. That, that's good, we want them to understand it, but we're actually simplifying it so not only can they understand it, but they could, after hearing it once, communicate it to someone else. That's at the core of what we call viral velocity. And to have a high viral velocity, it has to be simple enough for someone else to do your dirty work for you, to spread your idea. So that's number one. Number two, it's gotta be surprising. Make your idea surprising. That's because all of us come to any bit of information we're encountering with the patterns and the paradigms of everything we've experienced in our entire life, right? So the tendency is, okay, I, I've heard about this product, I've heard about this company, I've heard about this brand. Oh yeah, that was like this other one. I've heard about it before, I'm not that interested. That's the default position people are coming with because they're inundated with ideas. So we need to break through that pattern. We need to be surprising in some way that causes them to take notice. It's the opposite of what they expect. It's a different angle in what they're used to. And that's the second element to increase our viral velocity and make ideas more contagious. Third, significant. So we could be simple and surprising, but if we don't have significance, it won't have the resonance we want. Like here's an example of something that's simple and surprising. I could say the secret to marketing is blah, right? That was, it was simple, okay? Secret to marketing is blah. It was surprising, you didn't expect me to go blah, <laughs> but it wasn't significant because it didn't tell you anything. So can we also say something of value, of importance, something that is important in the world or our field or our industry? And if we can do that, we can keep it simple, we can keep it surprising, if we can keep it, we can make it significant, then congratulations, we have a viral, we have a contagious idea. So let's look at this from the example of um, the Kloof example we just discussed. So our core idea we were, we were spreading is that your dog's breed reveals your romance potential. So the question is, is that simple? Absolutely. The reason that idea can spread is like, okay, we're saying dogs match their owner. It's a concept that's easy to understand, but also it's just a concept that's in our cultural uh, kind, of, kind of ethos, right? It's like this idea that, oh, oh yeah, people kind of have dogs that sort of look like them or, or act like them. People are attracted to those kind of dogs. So absolutely, that's an easy concept to get. Dogs match their owner. Very simple. Second, is it surprising? Well, actually, it's part of the culture, but it's a little surprising that you're saying, my, you know, my dog equals my love life. Like, remember those headlines from, uh, I, I think Time Magazine was one, what your dog says about your sex life? You just don't expect, you know, the word dog and sex life to be in the same sentence at all, right? So it absolutely breaks through a little bit of the clutter and the noise. And third, is it significant? It is, because all of us, whether you're single, you're married, you're in a long-term relationship, all of us generally want to be perceived as more attractive, right? And if there's this simple idea that dogs match their owner and it's surprising, like your dog equals your love life, and it's significant, well, wow, this, this information could make me more attractive. It's important. And that's why that was a viral idea that had a high potential for viral velocity. That's why we loved it at, at, at PR Hacker, okay? Let's look at another example, because um, you might be saying, okay, I like, I, I get this concept, simple, surprising, significant, but you just gave me uh, you know, an example dealing with like dogs and puppies. Of course that is viral. So what else can we do? What other examples do we have? So this is a proverb. A bird in hand is worth two in the bush. This is a proverb that has uh, you know, lasted for hundreds, thousands of years, and it actually permeates all kinds of cultures. So let's analyze this from a viral perspective. How did this idea go viral? So is it simple? Absolutely, if you're gonna cross over like thousands of years, cultures, it's gotta be about something people can relate to. Birds and hands, kind of as simple as it gets. Is it surprising? It is, because what this actual proverb says is that one is better than two. Now, a lot of things in your life are like, okay, I'd rather have two cheeseburgers, not one. I'd rather have you know, two cars instead of one. But this says, you know what? This proverb says it's surprising because the one that you have now, that's worth more than two you could possibly have later, okay? Absolutely it's surprising. It's a new kind of math. Third thing, is it significant? 
Absolutely. It's a widely applicable bit of wisdom. You can use that in all sorts of ways. So maybe you're a startup founder. We have a lot of startup founders that like to watch our videos and are our clients. And you're like, okay, um, shoot, I got to decide if I pivot to this new thing, but it's going to take a lot of programming time, or if I'm going to stick with what we're what we have now and just try to like market and generate more customers, right? So then if you know a bird in hand is worth two in the bush, you're like, okay, I better stick with what I have. I know I can do that now rather than doing the new fangled uh, tech, uh, extravagant tech uh, plan that we might not be able to execute right away, right? So it's widely applicable wisdom and you can, uh, you can apply it if you're living in a village 2,000 years ago, right? So it's hugely significant. So that's why this is a viral idea, and proverbs are a great thing to study for understanding viral ideas and viral messaging because the fact that they spread through cultures, they lasted um, multiple lifetimes, shows how viral they really are. Now finally, you might be thinking, okay, Ben, you've given me a dog puppy example, you've given me you know, a proverb as an example, but is there something more contemporary? And so to do this, I'd like you to kind of set aside your political hats for a second. I'm going to give you a political example because I think it really illustrates this. Um, but set aside who you voted for, against, Republican, Democrat, some other party. Um, and let's look at this uh, political example from a viral perspective. Okay? So I like to call this the Great Wall of Trump. And if you remember in the, in the uh, recent presidential election, uh, Donald Trump came from, he was a celebrity candidate, he was well known. A lot of people did not take him seriously at the beginning or think he had any chance of winning. And he had a concept that spread him as a candidate in an unprecedented way that I would argue he probably would not be U.S. president now were it not for this viral example. So the Great Wall of Trump, was it simple? Absolutely. A lot of politicians have seven point plans on immigration. Hard to spread those virally, right? I told you, you need to get someone's attention right away when they're distracted, busy with something else. I mentioned you need to be able to, uh, you know, them not to just understand it, but communicate it to someone else. You give them a seven point plan. It's gonna be one, hard for them to understand. Most people can, can, can really track three things at most at once. Five at the very most, seven, no way, right? And, uh, and are they gonna be able to explain to someone else? No, they're not gonna remember your seven point plan. So it's a wall. You know, everyone knows what a wall is. It doesn't get simpler than that. Second, is it surprising? Absolutely. It's not normal for a politician to even suggest we're going to build a wall with another country as a way of solving a problem. It's unusual. So it captured people's attention right away. It wasn't normal. Is it significant? Absolutely. Because what it signified or symbolized in, 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 directly is that Trump was tough on immigration, right? So it was this, it didn't matter if it was achievable or not, or if it was buildable or not, or any of these other things. From the point of view of significance, it symbolizes his position. It was not normal, so it really got attention right away, and it was absolutely simple. So if you heard this, you're like, oh yeah, Trump wants to build a wall, right? You could communicate that to someone else. But from a viral perspective, it was an idea that was easier to spread. And what I would argue is that as you go through your marketing plans, your brand plans, your company plans, your causes that you're trying to promote, if you can think of it from this simple, surprising, significant paradigm, you can add a lot more viral velocity than you otherwise had that could turn ideas that would be sound great in you know, the marketing meeting or the boardroom, but that are not implemented, are not very successful, you can turn them into things that can be highly successful. Okay, so here's the viral litmus test, simple. Can you understand the idea or concept or message in nine seconds or less? We've done a lot of testing of this. YouTube will tell you 15 seconds, right? You have 15 seconds to convince someone to watch the video. We think it's even less than that because people are getting more distracted, more busy. They've seen more types of viral listicles and quizzes and everything else. So you got nine seconds. Number two, surprising. The question to ask yourself, does it defy your expectations? That even includes for a lot of content you assume to be viral. Like you have that viral cat video. Well, People are waiting for the viral cat video. They've seen ones before. How can you turn that on its head? Significant. Does it convey a deeper truth? Is it something that it says that's deeper, deeper meaning, something important, some kind of reflection, something that is of high value? And sometimes this takes a little work to achieve all three of these things, but if you do that, the results are enormous. Okay? So we've said context is contagious. We can increase our relevance. We've said ideas are contagious. By making ourselves simple, surprising, and significant, we can make our ideas easier to spread. But creativity is contagious. Let's talk about actual tactics and plans so that your next marketing campaign, what can you do to really spread that message? That's at the core of 
how do we scale creativity? So the key to unlocking creat viral creativity is to make it rapidly scalable. That is hugely, hugely important because, because um, new things are trending at a moment's notice. New hashtags are spreading. So if we see an opportunity to jump on that conversation, we got to go now. We got we to gotta pitch this or seed this or promote this today, in an hour, tomorrow. So we can't be you know, having a process where it takes us a month to get a lightning bolt of an idea that is our viral idea. We have to make it scalable. Let's look at some examples and ways to do that. So PR Hacker, we have 27 different viral blueprints. Each is a creative method for, for building and disseminating a viral story. So think of it this way. These blueprints are, uh, we've used them again and again to make ideas spread, to make things go viral. And I want to share some, with you, uh, some of them with you today because I think this can help unlock your creativity and make it more scalable more quickly. So here's our first blueprint. And, we, and every blueprint for us has a code name. This is called Goliath. Um, and every blueprint has a central question that it's based on. So the question for Goliath is, what big brands or iconic companies can we leverage to get more media coverage? So these are the kind of companies that are like the Apples of the world, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Budweiser's, one of our clients, the you know, GE, Exxon, just companies that for you know, just who they are, they'll get covered, right? There's like a New York Times, several in fact reporters who are covered, to, uh, who are assigned to cover Apple, right? Apple does something, they're gonna cover it. So how can we leverage the coverage they get to insert ourselves into the conversation? Three steps. Number one, we monitor big brands in related subject areas. Number two, we identify recent and timely brand news. And number three, we comment on this news and relate it to our messaging objectives. So let me give you some examples, some story ideas. So we have a client that um, has a new kind of virtual bank that can really lower your fees and improve things for, for business banking. So, our sample headline, when we pitched this, we were seeding this with a lot of media outlets to seed our viral story. Does the Wells Fargo fake account scandal signal deeper mistrust of business banking fees? So in this case, Wells Fargo is the Goliath. And there's a major story about all of these um, kind of fake accounts they were creating um, to generate more fees for themselves. And so we, can we leverage on that and comment on that? Even if our brand is not, uh, is not known, suddenly we're a part of that conversation. Or here's another example. Will the forthcoming iPhone 8 be all about Apple's new augmented reality technology? So for one of our clients that has an AR platform, suddenly the great news is Apple's expanding into AR, but they're super secretive. They're not talkative. There's no one at Apple to interview when they haven't announced it yet. So suddenly we can insert our client into the conversation and they can be part of that Apple story that spreads all about their expertise and thought leadership on augmented reality. Okay? So that's the Goliath blueprint. Really, really powerful. And that's why there's never a case where you should say, oh yeah, like, okay, if I was a big company, I could generate all this viral news, I could get ideas to spread, but we're just a small startup, how are we gonna do it? Well, congratulations, you get to leverage all the big companies. Next blueprint, a snowball. Here's the question this is based on. What recent story in a high profile media source can we use to snowball coverage to other media outlets? So, the process works like this, number one. Monitor top tier national media outlets. What stories are in the New York Times, Forbes, Fortune, Wall Street Journal, USA Today? Two, identify a unique story that could actually be covered by other local or niche outlets. So what we're doing is we're gonna take that story, we're gonna spread it other places. Three, feature that national story in our pitch. So we'll say, hey, did you see that recent article in the Times? Here's the link. And then pivot to related story angles. Here's how we could discuss a new angle on this. So, Here's an example. One of our clients um, is a drone, drone mapping platform. So there's a story in the New York Times how airborne drones could be used to save heart attack victims. So that was a story that, that did not feature our client. But suddenly we took that story and we snowballed it to all sorts of local media outlets, niche industry trade publications, all saying, hey, did you see that New York Times article? Um, for all of you healthcare publications, um, here's how airborne drones could impact that. And here's how their mapping capability, by the way, our client does drone mapping, can help transform those industries. So suddenly by doing that, we got dozens of media outlets interested. Once those dozens of media outlets were interested, it snowballed to hundreds more. Second example, um, this one I love. Um, using, if you know the show, John, uh, John Oliver's show on HBO, um, funny guy, but also makes insightful commentary. So he did a whole show 
on the 911 system being antiquated. So for our client that makes a replacement for home phones, this was an opportunity because what basically John Oliver was saying was that your home phone works way better than your mobile phone for 911 locating you. So it was a great case for to use this home phone replacement system. So the headline we had, we pitched was, is John Oliver right? Can Uber really find you faster than 911? And that's a story that suddenly everyone all across the country wanted to talk about and cover, right? We use that John Oliver example to snowball. So Goliath, snowball, and here's the third one I like to illustrate with an example. This is how to slingshot around a planet. And here's how to think about this. And, and I don't know if this looks familiar. I'm going to take my sip of water, let you soak in what V and what U means. And this is, among other things, if you've seen the movie Martian with Matt Damon, this is how Martian, how, how they rescued Matt Damon. This is also how, um, and if you see the movie Apollo 13, which is, of course, based on the real life Apollo 13, um, this is how uh, those, uh, those astronauts got home. And this is how it works. You have a spaceship with velocity V and a larger object, a moon, something else big, moving at velocity U. If you go around that bigger object, you come out with a speed of twice the speed that that big object was moving plus your velocity. Okay? So that's a little bit of astrophysics for you. We're full service at PR Hacker, so you get a little uh, astrophysics learning along with your marketing uh, advice and strategies. Um, but that's how to slingshot around a planet. Now. Let me take this one step further, which is how to slingshot around a bigger brand. So that bigger brand's media coverage, and we're talking about your competitors and there's a larger competitor, right? So you're the scrappy startup, here's the larger big brand. Or you're a big brand already, but here's the super big mammoth global brand, right? So this is you, this is the big brand. Can you slingshot around them? That's the essence of the blueprint we call a slingshot. And so, Question is, which media outlets have covered our competitors and how can we add our stories to theirs? So this is a specific set of tools we've built up at Peer Hacker. You can do this on your own. You can talk to us about how we can do this for you. That allows us to, one, we search for competitor media hits over the past 12 months. So everything that our competitors have gotten covered in the media for 12 months, um, we, we, uh, we map that out, we monitor that. Two, we have software and tools, or you can do this without software and tools, that immediately convert that to a list of media contacts. So let's say our competitors generated 2,700 media placements in the past 12 months. That represents 2,152 journalists. We have that in a media list. We click a button, it immediately converts. Third, we pitch a new story angle that highlights our competitive edge. So here's the beauty of this. Our competitors have already done half the work to identify all the journalists we can pitch. Like, thank you for competitors. Now we can pitch them a story that one-ups the competition or adds a new angle or adds a new insight or adds some kind of data that we have a monopoly over, right? So we're going to slingshot around our competitors' coverage. And here's some examples of headlines. So for one of our clients that actually is one of the top um, viral GIF platforms in the world, we have a headline, Does Size Matter? While more movie studios are embracing short-form snackable moments. So that was pitched to all the places that covered um, in the movie trade vertical, places where that was covering what are new platforms for marketing movies on. Any competitor of ours or indirect competitor, if they got mentioned, they were pitched a story on stackable moments that gave us great places and a great list of media contacts that would take our story. Or here's another example for a real estate property management system. We looked at all the other competitive tools and we pitched a story. Can you slash monthly management fees by 20%? New property management tool boosts profits. So suddenly, all of those places that cover our competitors, our competitive uh, position was that we can help you slash fees unlike other systems. And so suddenly, we're pitching that, and we're part of the conversation. So if your competitor gets, a, gets oh, you're like, oh, how did they get that mentioned? They were featured here. Why were, we, why were we not featured? Using the slingshot, you ensure that, one, you could be featured right after them, and two, the next time that happens, you won't be left out. That's why that's a powerful strategy. Another blueprint, bold ask. What bold question could we ask that would reposition our brand and make us seem newsworthy? So here's how this works. One, assess our current brand perception. What do people think about us now? Number two, define a new preferred brand position. So if our you know, perception is here, how do we move them over here? And three, pose a powerful question between um, the two positions that bridges the gap. Right? So that's the power of this question. And sometimes just asking the question shifts how we're perceived. So 
Here's a powerful question that does that for one of our clients that is a new way for reversing diabetes. A headline, can this startup reverse diabetes in 100 million people within the next eight years? That's a bold ask. Now, let's say they only end up reversing diabetes for 80 million people. Okay, they didn't quite meet that, but by asking it as a question, now it shifts the perception. Suddenly this is an important company. Like, wow, this could reverse and improve the health of 100 million people. Amazing. Second, second headline here. Can you get $4,274,700,000 worth of art in your startup office for free? It's an interesting headline because what we're doing here is this is for a client that actually puts digital art like the Mona Lisa um, on any TV like such as in your startup office. So we've actually asked a bold question to change the perception to say like, wow, now you can have the great works of art on, you know, in your office using their platform. We had another headline that also did very well for that one, which is like how to get Bill Gates' art uh, collection for free, right? That was a, a pitch to other outlets, also did very well. So a bold question shifts the perception of your company and shifts, it shifts its perception of, of its importance. And you can do that, and that's why we love a bold ask that um, has the potential to make that um, paradigm shift, okay? And finally, I wanna talk about holiday the holiday blueprint. So what interesting holidays or occasions can we leverage to drive broader interest? So there's a seasonal uh, uh, calendar that happens and there's big dates like you know, Christmas and 4th of July if you're in the US or you know, New Year's. But there's also all of these little moments on the cultural calendar um, that you can leverage. So here's how you do it. If, if you are more timely, you are more relevant. If you're more relevant, more people will spread your ideas. So, one, identify buzzworthy holidays or events related to our topic, to your topic. Number two, you offer a time-sensitive call to action. So there's a reason for people to act right now to benefit from what's going on right now. And third, we connect our value proposition to the special occasion to drive our core messages. So let me give you an example. Um, uh, of uh, one of our clients, Postmates, a food delivery app. We have this headline, Cinco de Mayo, food delivery app to give uh, 5,000 Houston residents free burritos. So suddenly, we've generated a, a, a news story. We've created a Cinco de Mayo news story. Lots of media outlets need stories to, co to cover that. We have something surprising. You don't often get free burritos. And also, we have a viral trigger on, we're only giving away 5,000, you better act now. That's a call to action to, ask, to act today. Okay, or here's another one we did for Budweiser, National Drink Beer Day. Budweiser's survey reveals what your drink says about you. Okay, so that one is for a little known holiday like, like National Drink Beer Day. Suddenly, Budweiser is getting hundreds of media outs covering them. They're not covering Heineken. And uh, that's making a difference in, in market share for them because they're top of mind with everyone else. Oh my gosh, National Drink Beer Day. I didn't have any plans. I'm gonna celebrate it with a bud. Okay, so really, really powerful. And this is so powerful, in fact, that at PR Hacker, we created our own platform to leverage the holiday blueprint. We call it National Today. It's at nationaltoday.com. And National Today, it helps consumers celebrate each day, but it helps brands uh, via online broadcast, social and influencer channels get out their message to consumers. So you can check it out. Um, if you are a brand, a company, or a product, um, we, we use this with our clients, but you don't even have to be one of our clients to work with us on a potential partnership or, or sponsor a day on National Today. And we were able to reach millions of people through that platform to leverage those time-sensitive holidays. Like recently, it was International Day of the Nacho uh, coming up. Um, I think uh, uh, soon we have National Pumpkin Day. Um, there's fun days, there's serious days, there's cause-related days. These are all ways to make yourself more relevant. And now there's a platform to help you spread the word. Okay, so here's an example of clients of ours that drove key performance indicators um, by leveraging these seasonal windows. So na uh, Budweiser, National Drink Beer Day, they generated the equivalent of a Super Bowl ad worth of coverage simply by leveraging this holiday. Or a brand like Del Monte, we did a campaign for them um, leveraging National Today on um, the Del Monte Green Bean Index, which states love green bean casserole the most. We put green bean casserole top of mind all across the country, leveraging the Thanksgiving prep window, 
11% in-store sales lift for Del Monte from a multi-billion dollar CPG, an amazing result. Meow Mix, we did a whole campaign around Oscars weekend, on Oscars weekend, where we actually not only generated one million plus social shares, but we created the Cat's Meow Awards, which is basically the Cat Oscars for cat viral videos. We pitched it at the same time as, as the Oscars weekend so that every time a news outlet announced um, the Oscar winners, they had to announce our Cat Oscars too. And finally, for Postmates, Father's Day, generated 12,000 plus new orders simply by leveraging this call to action to act today. So really powerful. Um, how can you get consumers to do something now? We know that if they don't delay, if they don't procrastinate, if they don't put it off, if they're not distracted by something else in their lives, people lead busy lives, you're much more likely to get that conversion. Okay? And so for time, I'm going to sort of skip this blueprint. But as you do this, as you leverage all these things, you can roll this out to lots of local markets. So one of the big things is one size fits all, does not fit all. If you can create a local result at scale, you can be much, much better off. Okay? So some of the viral bl blueprints to summarize. Goliath, leverage a bigger brand name to garner media interest in our brand. Snowball, use a story in a high profile media outlet to spur interest from additional outlets. Slingshot, that's where we slingshot around competitor coverage, a bigger brand. We use that to clue us in on the best places for us to pitch our story. Bold ask, a surprising question that shifts our perception. Holiday, these timely, newsworthy um, events that make you relevant right now, that give you a great call to action. And of course, we can roll that out in local markets all across the country. Right? So the key thing to understand here is that the math of viral stories is that, hey, we do that Goliath blueprint. We pitch it out to Bay Area Tech. Even if we have a low conversion rate, 1% conversion on 700 media contacts, that's seven media hits we get. But now we use our snowball. So now we're snowballing. We're pitching a career-related story for the snowball, 5,000 media contacts, a 1% conversion rate. That's 50 media hits. Then we do our bold ask, and we target that at a relationship crowd. That's like our, let's say, that, um, that uh, doggy dating story. 7,000 media contacts cover relationships. Even at a 1% conversion rate, that's 70 media hits. Finally, we do our rollout pitch to business, 9,000 media contacts. Again, the 1% conversion rate, that's 90 media hits. So what I'm trying to show here is that you could take one of these blueprints and do it and, and, and achieve success. But what if you, instead of doing one of them, stack them up laterally? Now, you can, uh, you can achieve 217, that's going to be media placements or influencer placements or other viral um, levers you're pulling. And suddenly, you're going to get much more result. So going viral is the sum of multiple contagious stories. It's not about locking yourself in a room, getting that lightning bolt of creativity and insight, and being like, that's the hit. right? Sometimes people come to us and said, OK, does that mean we need to, to, to go viral? We need to have like the next ALS ice bucket challenge. right? So no, you don't have to dump ice water on yourself. You could try a riff on that. But the key is aggregate multiple tactics, use multiple blueprints. Scalable creativity has an ROI, and that's why we like to be, use blueprints to be systematic with our creativity, work more laterally rather than sequentially to give ourselves the chances for the greatest chance of success. If you do that, you dramatically increase your odds of going viral. And even if you didn't go viral on a campaign, you, you generate a high ROI, high KPI campaign because you've leveraged multiple tactics. Brings us to the final section. Emotions are contagious. This is one of my favorite sections because it deals with the psychology of why people act and take action. And one of the things you could do is target emotions that cause immediate action. That's not all emotions. Let me give you an example of an emotion that does not cause immediate action. Deep sadness. When you're deeply sad about something, you just don't go out and do something you want, like most people, you know, you go back. You be alone, you crawl on the bed, you curl up on the covers, maybe you get the pint of Ben and Jerry's or pop in the video, but you're not out shouting from the rooftops when you're sad. So instead, how can we find actions and, and, and emotions that trigger those actions that you do do right away, right? Whether that's digitally, you, you share something, you like something, you love something, you comment on something, or offline actions. You go, um, you go buy something, you tell a friend about something, you show up at an event, right? How do we create those kind of emotions that, that cause immediate action? Okay, so a question for you is, what is the most shared section of the New York Times? Uh, lifestyle? Travel? 
I, someone, people who are really dark who come to my presentation are like obituaries. I was like, no, 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 that's not the most shared. Uh, what is the most shared? Comics? Crosswords? What if I told you that it's the science section? And it's the science section because it activates an emotion called awe. And what awe, and that's not like awe, that's like awe, like A-W-E, awe, is your sense of connection, your sense of wonder, how we're all connected in this world together. And it's not every science story. It's not like the super technical detail. It's like the story that says, wow, maybe there actually is life out there on another planet. What does that say about the human condition today? And imagine that. Or wow, what if this science discovery could allow us to reverse aging and we're all going to be like looking like we're in our 20s when we're in our 80s by the year 2050. It's like that sense of awe and wonderment. And that is a huge driver of action, which is driving the social sharing. So let's look at that and say, how can we use that in our marketing campaign? So here's a real world example. This is Morris the cat. Very cute, very cuddly. Um, also, he's a client of ours because uh, he's the nine live spokes cat. And we were hired to bring Morris back as a celebrity. Think of, if you don't know who Morris is, if you're a little bit too young, he's like grumpy cat before grumpy cat. And it was our job to bring him back. So um, we did this. Now, there was a very famous social media agency that had uh, Morris and Nine Lives as a client before us. And they did cute cat, you know, photos, funny stuff, timely cat stuff did okay. Average organic reach on Facebook for them was about 2,500 people on, on average they would reach organically. So we came in, Pierre Hacker, now we did many of the same things. We have, you know, this is some of our content here. We have cute cat photos. Cute, cute, yes. We had other bits of timely things and other triggers and other kind of funny headlines. We, you can see this doesn't look super like branded or anything like that. We want to do stuff that like looks organic for people to share. Sure. But we did one thing here that was different, which is we activated awe. And we did that by connecting the sense of awe and wonder and, 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 and connection to the human condition. So what we said is, you know what? This content isn't about cats. It's actually about humans. And it's about insight for humans as delivered by their interest in cats. So you can see this first one. We have Morris Cat Wisdom number two, nap to win. And what it says here is, you deserve a good nap. Personally, I sleep, sleep 16, 17, 18, maybe 19 hours a day, but not 20 hours. That would be excessive. And you see the cat napping very comfortably here. So what this is saying is this is triggering an emotion that's saying, oh my gosh, I should nap more. Why don't I just sleep in? Why do I have the alarm clock and the snooze? Like, I owe it to myself to take a nap, right? So it's something about humans that it's activating, okay? And it's that awe and wonder, that insight. Second one, you have this cat, and you can see the cat. There's a plant knocked over, and it says, Morris Cat Wisdom number six, don't blame yourself. Stuff happens. Things fall over. Were you the one who discovered gravity? Unless your name is Sir Isaac Newton, the answer is no, right? So for this one, what we're saying is actually to activate on wonders, you know what? Mistakes happen. You screw up. Give yourself a break. Don't blame yourself. It's okay. You get a pass. That's fine. And so we're activating that people saying, you know what? That's right. Morris the cat is right. That cute cat is right. You know, I should give myself a pass. And so when we're doing that, here's the result that happened. This is the number of shares. So before the basic post, before we activated awe, this line, delineates the two. We went from, in the average, I think it was like uh, one, you know, one to two month period, one and a half month period, 7,500 shares to 83,000 shares. That's up 11 times. Same cute cat photos, right? But we're activating the awe motion. This is the organic audience reach. Went from about 2,600 before to 25,000 after. After we keep developing and optimizing this, we got it up to the 50,000 plus on the average audience. So this is unpaid reach on Facebook, simply by having content that's shareable and resonates. Number of likes, up 11x. Number of comments, up 7x. Okay, so this has immediate social media relevance for, for all of your marketing campaigns. What I'd encourage you to do is, maybe you're watching this and like, hey, we're a B2B enterprise company with 12-month lead cycles. How do we apply this to our social? So the key is, ask yourself a series of three whys. So, it's not just why your social analytics platform, why someone should have it so they can monitor their social analytics. You ask yourself a second why. Why do they want to monitor social analytics? So they can you know, grow your social analytics, so they can improve them. Then you ask the third why. Why do they want to grow, why do they want to grow their social analytics? Well, so they can look better for their boss, so they can look better when they have to present to the board, so they can drive more sales, all those things. So those activating emotions you're looking at, even for your B2B companies, how do I look better for my boss? And can, can this help me do that? 
how do I go into the boardroom and they want to just like, you know, give my company $10 million more money for our, you know, uh, Series A or Series B or something like that. Those are all the emotions you want to be able to activate. When you do that, you get a much, much better marketing result. So it's not just about your product benefits. It's about what are the emotions in your audience that they experience through those benefits. Okay? Here's a couple more real world examples and then we're, we're, we'll wrap up. So a, a client of ours, CrowdMed, which is a platform for um, crowdsourcing difficult medical diagnoses. The key for us for CrowdMed was actually looking at shifting their messaging to focus on activating emotions through the power of miracles. So what we actually did was we repositioned the pitch and we called it Miracle on Tech Street, the Silicon Valley company that was helped bringing about miracles. When we did that, suddenly, coverage, widespread coverage overall, right? They were a company that was worth talking about, that was worth spreading their message. Here's another example, a client of ours, Uma. So Uma has an interesting case where they're trying to sell a home phone replacement system, but also, really, they're doing a lot of smart technology around the home, which is can do all things like sort of protect your, your home from hackers, um, keep your home more secure. So we're activating for, for both. So in this case, for them, what we actually did was we did that 911 story about John Oliver we mentioned, right? Saying like, hey, if we activate the emotion of fear that is your family prepared if you have a 911 emergency, you need a home phone replacement. Suddenly, that draws a lot of attention to otherwise media outlets here aren't usually covering home phone systems, right? Or if we're doing the other story, which is focused on their smart home technology, we ran a survey of 2,000 people asking, have you been hacked in some capacity in the past because their system could prevent hacking. As soon as we ran local statistics, it was the rollout blueprint of what are the statistics in each state of the number of residents who have been hacked, suddenly their message spread all over. So these are activating emotions. It can be awe, wonder. It can be other things like fear that cause action right away. So to wrap up, the question for you is this. Which stories produce 10x better results? I'm going to give you two options. We're going to apply everything we learned about context, ideas, creativity, emotions, and let's see what you think. So I can't verify that, you're, that we're doing that at home. So think to yourself, jot down which of, of these stories you think is more viral. So option one, and this, by the way, this is for a, uh, a client of ours that has an app that can text you, uh, that actually prevents you from texting and driving by automatically reading your messages aloud to you when it texts you driving. Okay, so option A, here's the, here's the headline we're trying to spread virally. Five simple ways to stop texting and driving. Like, ooh, it has a number. Sounds like a listicle. Not too bad. Also, I like it because it brings uncertainty, it brings certainty to an uncertain world. Like, oh, there's five ways. What are the five ways? I'd like to know. Right? That's one option A. Option B, how to convince your kids never to text and drive again. Okay, so that one's kind of interesting because it's actually not even about the benefit to you. It's actually about your kids or something else. So what do you think? Option A, cool listicle. Option B, something about your kids. Let's look at the result. Option B, 10x more viral, 10x higher viral velocity. When we, we were testing this, when we did that, suddenly media outlets all over wanted to cover it. Uh, more than 30 different sheriff departments started petitions to get kids to sign and say they wouldn't text and drive. So why is that? It's activating an emotion that is in parents that is actually wanting to protect their kids and being fearful of something happening to them. So suddenly, and then this is why, by the way, when I say fear, we're not using fear in a negative sense. We're using it in a positive sense, in a positive sense to say, okay, I need to take the steps to make sure that doesn't happen in a positive way. So when they do that, many of you, if you're watching, if you're parents, you know, maybe you've texted and, you know, text and driven yourself, but the thought of your 16-year-old you know, son or daughter who has very limited experience behind the wheel doing, doing it is horrifying to you. Suddenly, that's an emotion that drives action. Okay, here's second second quiz for you. Um, this is for our client who's a marketplace to use gadgets. Option A, study. 72% of Americans hoard gadgets. Okay. Option B, study. 72% of Americans are compulsive gadget hoarders. All right, I'll give you five seconds. I'm going to take a drink of water. Which do you think are more viral? Well, here's the answer. It's option B. Now, most of, these, most of these examples describe a behavior. We ran a survey to get this result. And by the way, what our survey was, was we defined it as if you put a gadget in a drawer for six months and never used it, 
in any way and you just kept it there, you're a gadget hoarder. But in option B, we've actually driven an emotion. We've said compulsive gadget hoarder. That compulsive word is driving an emotion. We've just created a disease from thin air, right? We just created something that as soon as we pitch this, reporters are, are uh, messaging us back saying, OMG, I totally have this. You should see it in my desk drawer, right? So we're activating emotion there. So as you use these emotions, the words matter. You can optimize, you can test, you can improve. That's why at PR Hacking, we're often multivariate test eight different versions of a headline. And we'll, we'll start with eight, we'll narrow it down to four finalists, we'll narrow those down to two, we'll keep testing them on maybe groups of 100 small local media outlets, so we'll test it on a local small newspaper first before we pitch the New York Times, so that by the time we pitch the New York Times, it's optimized, it's ready to go, okay? So that brings us to what this is all about, which is con context is contagious. Remember, you can make your product, your brand more relevant by building that strategic context around yourself that makes you more interesting, more viral, more noteworthy. Number two, ideas are contagious. Remember, simple, surprising, significant. A bird in hand is worth two in the bush, right? Break through those preconceived notions in a way that allows people not just to understand your idea, but to spread it. Number three, creativity is contagious. You can scale creativity in real time by using this blueprint system. I mentioned many of them. Goliath blueprint, right? Someone leveraging someone bigger than you are. Slingshot, leveraging around your competitors. Holiday, um, leveraging what's happening today, even that quirky holiday that you can leverage, right? All of those ways are ways to scale creativity. And finally, emotions are contagious. Um, what that means is let's activate emotions that cause action. Let's drive awe and wonder or even fear sometimes as well. Let's optimize our headlines, our pitches, um, when we're communicating with influencers, we want them to spread our message, our digital marketing. Let's use it to activate emotions and cause action right away. So my name is Ben Kaplan. I hope that has been useful to you. I truly believe, like the slide says, marketing is contagious. And if you do that, um, you will find that your, all of your marketing campaigns have higher KPIs, higher ROIs. You'll find new ways to think about new and different marketing campaigns that you haven't thought of before. Even if your product isn't one that normally goes viral, you'll be able to find ways to do that. And you'll also learn the underlying message, which is lightning doesn't have to strike. You can systematize this where you can work laterally. You can aggregate multiple viral actions that cause the ultimate result you want. Happy to answer any individual questions. Come um, visit prhacker.com, click on the Take Action link, um, schedule a brain hurricane with us. We're happy to do it. And of course, if you have um, a client project or other work, we'd love to help um, you become more contagious and help that idea spread. Um, hope this has been helpful. Until the next time, cheers.